Good morning. Today I want to talk about something that I've been studying for many years and which I think is often uh, misinterpreted. And this is something called permaculture. And it is a design strategy for gardens, uh, for designing landscapes, and also really for informing your life uh, in a way that kind of works with nature. So I'm, I'm going to give you, first of all, I'll give you the textbook definition of this and then and we'll move forward. But here is the textbook for permaculture. And there are a lot of books on permaculture, but this is kind of one of the, uh, one of the very earliest ones by Bill Mollison, who was one of the earliest contributors contributors and probably probably I would say one of the most influential contributors to this concept of permaculture and uh, he claims to have uh, developed this uh, the the system of permaculture uh, but I know that there were other contributors to this uh, these these thoughts early on and so uh, we could talk about that in a, in a later um, episode for right now, we're going to stick with the Permaculture Designer's Manual, and I'll give you the definition that Bill Molson came up with, which permaculture is the, by definition, um, design and maintenance of agriculturally productive ecosystems with the diversity, stability, and resilience of natural ecosystems. And in his, he stated and believed that permanent agriculture was necessary for a stable society. So without permanent agriculture, which he shortened into the word permaculture, he felt that a stable society was impossible. And I think that's probably true. If, you, if your food sources are cut off, stability deteriorates pretty quickly. <clears throat> so to kind of digest this, to interpret this, took me a long time. And so I'm gonna give you my sort of definition of this and what I've kind of come up with is just a shorthand for this because there's a lot of big words there. Bill Mollison liked to use some big words. <clears throat> I like to kind of shorten things down and, uh, and, and make them a little more you know, easy to understand. So my, my definition really is that permaculture is food production and a lifestyle that is informed by natural laws. So it's, it's growing things and living in a way that is in agreement with the laws of nature. My, my reason for wanting to follow the, the, the permaculture model is that it, it seems to me that if you're not cooperating with nature, you are fighting against it. And fighting, in so many cases, is friction. It's friction which slows things down. If you've got two, two things, uh, two parts of a machine and they're kind of fighting together, they're not working smoothly. Things are not, things are not working as they should. And so I feel like by, by bringing permaculture into my life, I have learned more about how to work with the forces of nature, if you will, and, and stop wasting energy on all the small battles. So, in, in, for example, you know, in, instead of thinking about fighting pests, I think about working with pest predators to give them the opportunity to, uh, to mate, to lay their eggs, and to, uh, to procreate and you know, give them an advantage. So I try to give pest predators an advantage so that they can help me to remove the pests. Another example is, you know, instead of thinking about fighting floods or fighting you know, water, the way that you know water can cause a lot of damage in a flood situation, I think it's more 
helpful to think about encouraging the natural structures that used to uh, take care of this problem, like floodplains, um, like uh, the basically understanding that if you put structures on a floodplain and don't account for that, you will end up losing them perhaps every 10 years, perhaps they'll last longer than that, but eventually a flood will come and destroy what you have, what you have built. However, there are ways of using floodplains very productively. Um, another example is, you know, we, have, we all have neighbors, we have to live in a community. If we think about always fighting neighbors in terms of what they want, what we want, it's a difficult way to live. Instead, by building community organizations and by building friendships with people, even who we don't necessarily agree with, we create the social structures that help us deal with conflicts that inevitably arise. So anyway, permaculture, it's all about working with natural laws, whether they be sort of human dynamics or the fact that certain areas flood, you know, the fact that sunlight in the northern hemisphere, you know, shines uh, in, in a particular direction. It shines on the southern face of a wall and that can be used as a, you know, as an advantage when you're planting your garden. Um, and the sun at different times of the year as it is at different altitudes. So understanding that can be used in terms of designing houses that will be cooler in the summertime and warmer in the wintertime, et cetera. <clears throat> Permaculture also has, uh, has kind of a set of what it, it calls ethics. And I think some people uh, have read this in a way that's a little bit uh, overly didactic, overly prescriptive, but I, I, here's my, I'm gonna tell you what these ethics are and then I'll kind of tell you how I feel like they are helpful in my own life. So uh, the, the ethics of permaculture, are the three things that Bill Mollison described as the ethics of permaculture. One is care of the earth, the second is care of people, and the third is what he called setting limits on population and consumption. Um, other people have reinterpreted this and they've just sort of given it a shorthand of earth care, people care, and fair share, which is, uh, is equally cryptic, but it rhymes. Um, so I, I'm gonna give you my interpretation of these three ethics. And you can choose to interpret these in whatever way you like, but this is, this is uh, you know, from what I've read in the book and also just from what I've learned as, uh, as I've kind of studied this in practice. Um, you know, care for the earth is pretty straightforward. Care for soil, care for air, uh, care for water. It's taking care of these ingredients that create a, a healthy ecosystem. Uh, it's, I say it's straightforward, but there's an awful lot that goes into that. And you know, this, I'm not gonna go into all of this in, in just one video. Uh, the second ethic is care of people. And that is, it's, it's, it's you know, helping people understand and access resources. It's uh, educating people, it's sharing with people. And it is understanding the things that people really need. And sometimes that is, uh, you know, somebody might need food, but sometimes it is that they need understanding and they need somebody who will listen to them. And uh, maybe they need advice, but maybe they feel like they need to give advice. And so understanding all of these things goes into a care for people. There's also sort of the very literal you know, care of people, and that is you know, providing health care when people are ill. So that's a core ethic of permaculture. The third ethic 
which Bill Mollison described as setting limits on population and consumption. And this is, this is controversial the way that he stated it. And it was one of the, one of the few times that Bill Mollison got a little bit heavy handed in my opinion. And I think tried to prescribe something rather than following his own advice and looking at building the structures that help the problem solve itself in a natural way. And so I would, I would re rethink this a little bit and say that, you know, I think that, you know, Mollison was, he was great with plants. I'm not really sure that he knew all of the best ways of, of dealing with human psychology. The, it's very difficult to control human beings by setting limits on reproduction or on uh, you know population and consumption. People don't respond positively to that, at least in my opinion. However, if you look at the ways that people naturally set limits for themselves on consumption and on population, <clears throat> you'll find that population growth is often reduced by education. And that is something that I think is really key. And I think that may be something, maybe Mollison hit on that later or at a different time, um, but I think it's important to, to understand that education is important if we want to limit growth. And, and I think that because the, the earth is only a certain size, you can't have an infinite number of people on that earth. So we need to find strategies that help people limit their own growth. Kind of the same way that we need to find strategies to, uh, to control or to help nature control other things in our gardens, in, the, you know, in our environment. So education is important. Security is, is also important. It helps to bring down the population. When the population is insecure, quite often you will have uh, less stability in population. So if you want to stabilize population, security is important too. And security is, is something that can be brought about by better community organizations and also food stability, which permaculture helps to address. Um, addressing consumption is more of a challenge. How do you stop even educated people how do you encourage even educated people to stop overconsuming? And that's something that I haven't figured out. Uh, I would love to have uh, more ideas from the community on that, but uh, it's difficult to even stop oneself from overconsuming. I think we all find that. We go online, we realize that we can buy this, this, that, or the other thing, and it's so easy to buy it, to consume it, rather than creating it ourselves. Uh, so, I have tried to control that impulse <clears throat> in myself, but it's difficult to teach other people to control that impulse. And I won't say that I'm perfect at that either. This morning I bought a, 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 a new uh, heating probe for my, uh, my seed starting uh, uh, system so that I could try and keep things at the right temperature. You know, I just, I, I think about something and sometimes I just have to have it and, uh, and just go online and, and pretty soon I've spent another $20. Um, so <clears throat> all of these ideas take time. It takes time to implement the notion of permaculture, both in, in yourself and in your gardens and in your yard. And I've been working on this since 2014. It's now 2021. It's been about seven years. Having moved from one location to another location set me back several years, but also gave me more opportunities. So I'm several years into developing a new landscape. And so some of the things that I left behind were you know, 20, almost 20 years old, are, are 20 years old at this point. Grapevines, uh, cherry tree, uh, a number of other plants, blueberry bushes that, uh, that were fully 
mature and producing quite well, and I walked away from them. And so, <clears throat> so my transition has been slowed down, but I think I had to, I had to do this move to improve things um, and give myself new opportunities. So he suggests a three to eight year transition. Three would be very aggressive. I think eight years is probably a better bet in terms of transitioning your gardens, your farm, your homestead from more traditional methods into permaculture methods. Um, so along the way, and I won't go into the whole transition process, we can talk more about that later, but along the way, what you'd start to do is introduce perennial foods uh, you introduce water control uh, and and diversion uh, strategies. You uh, introduce no-till agriculture and soil building strategies like hugel culture beds and things like that, and adding uh, growing and adding nutrient naturally to your soil, uh, worm beds, composting, etc. He suggests production of fuel as well as food uh, on the homestead or in the in the gardens. I'm not quite sure how I can do that as much, given that I only have about a tenth of an acre here. But I suppose it's something that I can think about in the future. Uh, and he also suggests retrofitting the house uh, for energy conservation. And I've started to do that with the the heating system that I have and the solar panels that I have on my roof. I still need to move further along with things like increased insulation in the walls, stuff like that. Um, and, and then he also suggests, and this is more in terms of like a larger farmstead, you know, homestead. He's, he talks about replacing animal forage with tree crops. And, you know, I have, I didn't have animals to begin with, so aside from the three cats, uh, but the, the, there's no forage for cats really. Uh, I, but I have started to plant, I planted fruit trees and vines and perennial foods in my old landscape and I have started to do that here as well, but the trees are still very young, the fruit trees are young, the fig tree is doing great, um, I also have uh, uh, apple trees, Asian pears, pawpaw trees, planted, elderberry, but these things take time. Um, so so the, the overall philosophy, if I were to summarize the overall philosophy of, some, of, of permaculture, it would be you want to maximize the collection of the inputs that you want and minimize your wasteful outputs. And what that means is, you know, you think about the, the things that your plants need, the things that you need, uh, and depending on your climate, these can be different. Um, here in New England, the inputs that are helpful are sunlight. We don't get a whole lot of sunlight compared to some areas in, in, the, in the world, but here we do get a good deal in the summertime. So you want to maximize your collection of sunlight, both for producing food and for, you know, in the wintertime for keeping the house a little bit warmer. Uh, you want to, many areas have problems with water and we, if your landscape is designed not for water conservation, you can end up adding a lot of water to your landscape in the summertime to feed your plants, and I still do. I need to build more water conservation uh, strategies. That can include rain barrels, it can include increasing the amount of, uh, um, of mulch that you use on your gardens, uh, etc. There's also more complex ideas like using wind energy or directing wind energy for your benefit. Um, so, you know, obviously the <clears throat> one's mind goes immediately to generating electricity from wind, but also it, it's helpful to know where your wind paths are when you're planting trees and when you're building things that could, like trellises, that could get knocked over. Uh, but also it can be used, wind can be used in some situations to strengthen 
uh, organic structures like trees. But that's that's kind of beyond even my uh, ability to explain at this at this point in time. So you also want to minimize your wasteful outputs, like obviously your garbage and even your recyclables. People think that recycling is great. Well, it's better not to buy the thing that has to be recycled in the first place. We need to work on that in my household. We buy a lot of things that still need to be recycled. And we buy a lot of things that, that end up getting thrown away because of the things that we have delivered. And if you, if you can avoid that as much as possible, it's better in general for the, the, the earth, but it's better for your own pocketbook because you often end up spending money. You know, every package that you buy and throw away, you paid for that package. So if you can find ways to avoid that, uh, that is theoretically better. Uh, you want to avoid water runoff if you happen to live in an area where water is precious. Uh, you may want to avoid too much reflected sunlight or sunlight that just passes through and try and collect that. Like by putting up a trellis, you can get more sunlight. You can collect more sunlight when the sun is at an angle than if you just grow everything on the ground. By growing fruit trees and things that grow vertically, you can collect more sunlight. And so the more sunlight you collect, the more energy you retain, the more useful materials you can have at your disposal. Uh, <clears throat> and you want, to, you want to maximize your useful outputs. So we've talked about maximizing your collection of inputs, minimizing your wasteful outputs, and now you want to maximize your useful outputs. Things like food, things like fuel, things you know that is, are as uh, difficult to really pin down as happiness. You know, how do you maximize your happiness in your free time? And you can address even things like that that are as vague as that using permaculture strategies that we could talk about in, in later episodes. So, so to do all of this, how do we do all of this? Uh, it's a big topic, it's a, it's a big book, but uh, some of the strategies that are used to do what we've just talked about is regenerating the soil. So you're making it healthy again. How do you make your soil healthy? Is it just by buying fertilizer or is it actually by working with the soil? and working and understanding what it is that makes soil healthy. And I believe that it is by understanding what it is that makes soil healthy. So that is you know, always making sure that you use some sort of cover to keep the soil moist and to keep the sunlight off of the soil. That is a, a great way to improve your soil health pretty quickly and pretty soon. Uh, you want to capture, like I've already said, capture and use your water judiciously. You want to plant diverse crops. And that can help so many different ways. It can help rehabilitate the local ecosystem. It can help provide resiliency in the case of, you know, one crop fails. Well, you've still got all these other diverse crops. If you plant your whole yard in one crop, you're opening yourself up to so much uh, potential disaster if one pest or one disease comes through and eliminates it. But if you've got a wide variety of crops, you will always have something that succeeds and you'll have some things that don't. And you can more easily ignore those that don't. Uh, we need to re-educate ourselves on techniques that, that use nature as our uh, as our guide. We need to understand natural principles, and we've gotten pretty far away from that with, uh, with modern agriculture. And, and I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna give a big lecture about modern agriculture here, except to say that 
a lot of the methods that are used on large farms are just not appropriate for smaller homesteads and gardens. Whether or not they are appropriate for large farms, I'm going to leave that up to the large farmers because I can't change that from here, but I, I can say that I believe that there probably are other strategies that they might consider that might, uh, might be better for the soil, but that's not my specialty. What I can say for certain is that when you're planting your yard, following strategies of a, a, a giant uh, uh, farm, it's not necessarily applicable for you in your backyard. So you want the, the, the appropriate strategy, not just the one that looks good on uh, a, in, a, in a larger context. Um, and we also need to establish these connections with other human beings, establish these social networks. And I've worked pretty hard at this over the last six years personally. I've formed local permaculture uh, meetups. I've worked with kids volunteering in schools to build a school garden and tried to put out information. I've, I've done some public speaking on the, the topic of, uh, of food forests and uh, perennial foods and unusual edibles. And that's the kind of thing that I that really kind of makes me, uh, makes me excited is some of these unusual plants. So that's kind of my goal. It's been my goal in starting the Food Forest Garden Club is to bring people together uh, and to establish a social network or social networks that, uh, that can you know, help to bring us together in a way that is kind of you know, permaculture strategies uh, and, and to share what we know, what we've learned, what works. It's, it's very powerful when you get different people sharing ideas and cooperating and sharing seeds, things like that. So I have really enjoyed that process. It has enriched my life. And that's probably one of the best things that permaculture has, uh, has brought to me over the years is this, uh, is this community of uh, people who are doing creative things and solving, solving problems in creative ways. So that's, this has my, been my first episode on permaculture. I'm going to try uh, over, the, over the next few months, every so often, to put out another video on permaculture and kind of dig into some of the nitty gritty uh, topics that are covered in the designer's manual. Uh, really appreciate it. If you would give me any feedback, things that you want to hear more about with respect to permaculture, things that uh, you agree with here and things that you think might, you know, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm off the mark on something too. And I'd appreciate that feedback as well. Uh, but I would really appreciate also a thumbs up and, uh, and for you to uh, to keep in touch. So Thanks again for, uh, for subscribing and for being part of this community that I'm building. Uh, really appreciate it. And I'm so excited to be meeting everybody that, uh, that has already gotten in touch. So have a great day. Enjoy your coffee.